San Luis Valley, it was the venue of, of, of a large number of struggles. Maestro's case, in my estimation, is the first Hispanic desegregation case in the United States in which the Hispanics won. Senate Joint Resolution 16 concerning the Maestas desegregation case. Whereas the nation's earliest and longest unheralded victory in the fight against educational segregation took place in the San Luis Valley between 1912 and 1914, largely benefiting the children of Alamosa. This case kind of set a precedent in terms of the strategy to take on school segregation that got lost, that got lost. Why did it take over a hundred years for this case finally to be discovered. None of us were looking for this case. The case found us. It was an obscure sentence in a newspaper article. Mexican-American residents in Alamosa, Colorado were protesting educational segregation and, and they had filed a lawsuit. So I was like, Ruben, have you heard of this case? I almost fainted. I was shocked. I, as an educational historian, have never heard of this case before. This is really important, not only for the state, but nationally. Ruben got a hold of uh, the court's clerk here, who in turn got a hold of me and said, there's these academics that want access to this file. I says, what file? So it's a 1913 file. I said, oh my goodness, I don't know if we can find it, but let's look for it. Lo and behold, we found it. It was just unusual because it was so early compared to the other cases that we were aware of. And also it's just such an interesting part of the country uh, for this case to be uh, to be occurring in uh, the San Luis Valley, as you well know, um, has such a rich history. It was a very much an integrated family lineage of Hispanics and Native American, and that's pretty common for everybody in the valley. Treaty of Guadalupe wasn't that long ago before this case got filed, some 60 years or so, uh, there was a lot of discrimination. Not only were the norms changed, but the railroad was introduced, and that really brought in a whole new group of people. There wasn't a lot of communication on weaving those cultures together at the time. Many of the Hispanics in Alamosa County, if they weren't into agriculture, were working for the railroad in some form or another. Because Alamosa was a major railroad hub and they became second-class citizens. The struggle was to become full-fledged citizens entitled to all the perks, if you will, of citizenship, which included education. The main plaintiff was Francisco Maestas. Francisco Maestas worked for the railroad. He did very well. He was, according to the U.S. Census at the time, the only Hispanic to live on the north side of the tracks. The town was very much divided from the railroad tracks. The north side of the town was Anglo, the south side of the town was Hispano. Uh, they had separate grocery stores, they had separate barber shops. And the south side was where the Mexican school was created. And this is Zapata Park. Uh, it's currently a local playground. <laughs> and this is the site of the Mexican school. And everyone with a Spanish surname was going to attend the school here. Francisco Maestas had a son by the name of Miguel. Ten-year-old Miguel Maestas was forced to walk seven blocks from his home on the north end of Ross Avenue to the Mexican school building at the intersection of 9th and Ross. So we're walking down the same path Miguel and his sister Josie Maestas would have walked from their house uh, on the north side of the tracks to the south side of the tracks on Ross Avenue where the Mexican school would have been located. There were actually more than one family that went to the district previously and asked to change their students' enrollment and they were kind of brushed away. The case developed in, in the context of a culture in which there was a rise of the KKK. And I believe the KKK was behind the segregation of the Mexican schools down in Alamosa. At the same time, there was a rise of Hispanic activism. There was kind of this rallying support in the community of this isn't right and it's not just. On September 2nd, 1913, Francisco Maestas went to the superintendent of schools and asked to enroll his son. The request was refused and Maestas was told he had to enroll his son in the Mexican school because land for that school was purchased in 1909 to serve only Mexicans. 
I think that's really where Francisco was like, this is enough. They didn't take no for an answer. We were told no several times and in, instead of becoming uh, a victim, they just decided to come up with new solutions. How could they get their point across? There was a lot that happened prior to the, to the case itself. The case is kind of the end of a long process. Um, parents had, had petitioned, they had pulled their school kids out of school uh, in a boycott to protest what was happening. Uh, they had uh, contacted the, the state superintendent and asked like, what can you do for us? And they had been refused. They got a young law lawyer out of Denver, Raymond Sullivan. Francisco filed the lawsuit. Sullivan took the case to trial. They interviewed board members. One of the school board members said that he um, did not want to send his, um, want to have one of his children in a classroom with Mexican students. Uh, that it became clear that, that yeah, the, the school board members probably made their decision based on race. And, and one of the unique things uh, about the case was just how um, race was being understood and argued in, in the case. The then Constitution prevented the kind of discrimination based upon race in school. The assertion being made by the school district to answer to the suit was, no, those Mexicans are in fact white and we are not discriminating against them. So it kind of reversed the typical scenario of how a discrimination suit would occur. And, and then to have the, the the plaintiffs push back and say, no, we, um, you know, we are, we are Hispanos, we're Mexican, and you are discriminating based on, on our race. For that to be argued in 1913, 1914 was very, very unique. The nuance is that there is no national consensus of where we fit in the racial order. The racialization is so localized. Like, I'm not surprised that the, the Hispanos of Southern Colorado made this argument. It's part of their history. Of course, they would say that they're not white, that they're Mexicanos, Hispanos, right? They would make that argument. It, it's part of their history. The argument by the defense was really, these students need language support. Sullivan put the students on the stand. They had an interpreter, and before the interpreter could even finish his questions, in Spanish, the students were able to answer in English. The teachers who taught there were saying that they didn't, they didn't even teach in Spanish because they all spoke English. And I think that probably played a big factor in Judge Holbrook's decision. After a lengthy trial, District Court Judge Charles Holbrook issued an order to the school board and superintendent to admit the children to the public school most convenient to their homes. Holbrook stated that in the opinion of the court, the only way to destroy this feeling of discontent and bitterness. and bitterness, which has recently grown up, is to allow all children so prepared to attend the school nearest them. But Judge Holbrook was a former school teacher uh, taught in the South. Because Holbrook was born and raised in the South, that he must have known a lot about race Judge Holbrook ruled in favor of Francisco Maestas and the other community members and opened up schools equally to all people in the town. The Alamosa School District did not keep a record of this case and it kind of got lost in the sands of time. And I think the reason it got buried is because it was perceived by the Hispanic community as just one more battle and the battles continue. Uh, yeah, it was an important decision. Um, but it wasn't the end of, of, of the struggle. A lot of times folks will think um, that, the, that our history, um, it's all said and done, why don't you just let things go? Um, and, um, and actually, it is such an honor to be able to lift up that history. The committee decided on commissioning a bronze sculpture so that our community could learn about it. There are so little landmarks, monuments, reliefs dedicated to the history of Latinos in the United States. Not only that, I mean, it's so inspiring that you have a monument that is dedicated to community activism, resilience, educational rights. It may have taken a hundred years, but we're finally starting to see the fruits of our labor. Judge Martin today pretty much has the job that Judge Holbrook had 
in 1914. I was the first Hispanic uh, district court judge appointed in this district. That happened almost uh, 90 years after Holbrook made his decision. So, you know, it, it's a work in progress. Discrimination still exists. Um, certainly a lot of progress has been made. I certainly think there's a lot of progress still to be made. And some of those uh, achievements are going to happen in the courtroom. Uh, not necessarily all of them, but some of them are. I just hope that this case becomes part of uh, Colorado's curriculum. They were told that they weren't going to be able to fight this, that no one was going to listen to them, and they decided that wasn't an answer that they were willing to take. A big takeaway from this story is don't give up on hope.